All right, we'll we'll start with refuge in Bodhicitta. Sange chodon sogi chonam la jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dage chun yan ki pe sonam ki dro la penje sange drupa sho sange chodon sogi chonam la jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chen yan gi pe sonam ki dro ha pen che sange dru pa sho sange chodon so ki chonam la jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chen yan gi pe sonam ki and allowing that to sink in. So today is Chenrezig, and I think probably Thursday we'll keep going with Chenrezig and then next week to Manjushri. And I'm guessing that you guys mostly have done some Chenrezig practice. Is there anybody who's never done any Chenrezig practice at all? You've never done Chenrezig? You've never done Chenrezig? Okay, so there's a couple newies. And I think that of all of the Tibetan Buddhist deities, this one is probably kind of our most common, um, I, you know, I hesitate to say most important because different things strike different people in different ways, but Chenrezig is considered particularly important because it's said that he's manifested in human form as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama is considered Chenrezig in human form. Now, of course, if you were to ask His Holiness, are you the Buddha of compassion? He would say, oh, no, 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 I'm a simple monk. I'm a simple monk. And um, that is very important modeling for us, because if uh, one of our teachers were to say, I am enlightened, I am the Buddha, what should we do? We should run. Yeah, run away, run fast, run hard, never look back, okay? Because if someone says they're enlightened, how on earth can we prove it? How on earth can we prove it if we're not enlightened ourselves? And so if someone is saying that they're enlightened, they kind of need to show you their miracles. And then of course, if they show you their miracles, they're gonna attract all sorts of hoopla and bedlam and all sorts of things. And it's just a big mess and it's counterproductive. So it's most effective for us as regular people and for the lamas who seemingly have realizations, for them to adopt the aspect of being ordinary also because it makes them relatable. If we think enlightenment is for special magic people that are a little bit different than us, then we can kind of say deep practice is just for them and like put it on the shelf and sort of think, all right, so I'll just do my little ordinary practice, but like special people, special people can practice Tantra, not me. So by His Holiness saying I'm a simple monk, what he's really saying is, there's nothing stopping you from doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And also he's showing us that we cannot take another person's measure. And so it's much more, I guess, productive or efficient or humble or useful, however you want to frame it. It's better to say, I'm like everyone else. Because the truth is that all of our minds are of an identical type. It's just some of us have trained our minds and some of us haven't. And just like life, sometimes it's not so linear. So we might have actually been very realized beings in a past life. We might have developed calm abiding. We might have had all sorts of magical abilities. And then what happened? We got distracted and we backslid and we were lucky enough to wind up a human being again. And now it's all we can do to just kind of like watch the breath for a few minutes without going nuts. So, you know, realizations of some types you don't slide back from but a lot of them unless you keep putting in effort you can kind of decline so that's also good to know so if someone says to you that they're enlightened run away okay <laughs> right does that make sense yeah and so you know it's not just like a false humility and like kind of a a sweet kind of modesty it's actually a very skillful modeling for all of us
Yeah. And we know then if we're Buddhist and we have Buddhist lay vows or Buddhist monastic vows, that the one of the vows that probably everyone has is not to lie. And what is the way that you break that vow from the very root? You know, we transgress it in a million different ways, just little white lies, little fib, you know, purify, restore. To break it at the root is to tell a great lie, which is about your spiritual attainments. So if you make out to be more realized than you are, that breaks that vow at the root, and it's an incredibly heavy misdeed. So it's also kind of like we want to get in the habit of kind of downplaying whatever we think we've achieved. One, because we might not be educated enough to know where we actually are. But two, um, you know, if we kind of do overestimate, people might trust us and follow us, and we actually don't know what the heck we're doing, and we might lead them astray. So it's better to kind of downplay and even maybe not to talk about your practice with anyone other than spiritual mentors and maybe Dharma friends. Maybe, but even with Dharma friends, it can be a little bit complicated because other Dharma practitioners might get kind of jealous or competitive, or they might feel like they're not doing well, or they might doubt you and think that you're full of yourself. So it's kind of like, in terms of your own realizations or lack thereof, that's kind of a conversation better for you know, the Sangha or your spiritual teacher, your gurus. It's just, it's just a bit more clean, clear, less problematic. Yeah. So anyway, that's a side note. But so when we say His Holiness, the Dalai Lama is the Buddha of compassion, we say that with kind of a, let's just, you know, leave that in ambiguity and maybe, and of course, if you hear His Holiness teach, you think that is an amazing being who has amazing qualities, but also he's representing what we ourselves as ordinary people can do with our minds. He's, he's a representative of our own potential, and that's a far more accessible way of relating. It can really inspire the mind to think the Buddha of compassion is in human form, and if that does it for you, think that way. But it's also probably not something to be saying to your non-Buddhist friends because they might not really get it and it might cause all sorts of issues, right? But because His Holiness is seen as the Buddha of compassion and Chenrezig is kind of the main deity of Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism, it's going to keep coming up again and again. So it's good to kind of figure out who is Chenrezig and why is this practice so important? Okay, so before we get into it, there was just a question that was sent to me via email, and so I want to make sure I address that right off the bat, and then we'll go into Chenrezig stuff. So the student was saying, I was wondering if sometime during the course you could help me have clarity on a big picture question. I understand that the Lamrim Chenmo was written as a base or preparation for engaging in Tantra. I understand too that Tantra is meant to be a quick path, which for some could mean enlightenment in one lifetime after many previous lifetimes of practice. So it seems like Tantra would be the main practice while never leaving Lam Rim and the foundational practices entirely behind, leading to Nirvana and full awakening. What I'm confused about is how Mahamudra or Dzogchen fits in as it also seems to be talked about as a quick path to enlightenment in one lifetime, especially by other Tibetan schools of Buddhism, especially the Kagyu and Nyingma. So is practicing one or the other simply a personal preference or are they meant to be complementary and both practiced after Lamrim studies and practice? It seems that other schools of Buddhism practice both but tend to focus more on Mahamudra Zogchen, whereas Galukpa's focused mostly on Tantra. Did Lama Tsongkhapa practice Mahamudra? Do you know his views on practicing Mahamudra versus Tantra? It seems like once a practitioner begins to engage in either of these practices, there is just so much to practice that doing both would make become too spread out and not deeply engaged. Yet by excluding one or the other, one would lose out on some powerful practices. Thanks for any help understanding all this. Zogchen Mahamudra, for those of you that don't know, is basically using the mind as your object of meditation and seeing that it's empty of inherent existence. 
And this is done in a number of different ways. Some of them work through an analytical process and arrive at a kind of an experiential place of viewing the mind and understanding that it's empty and holding the mind on that. Some do more um, kind of straight to it, cut to the chase. The guru introduces you to the nature of mind and you just kind of abide in that. There's a million different ways, not a million, there's many different ways of doing Mahamudra or Dzogchen and they're all really beautiful and powerful. And yes, it is done in our tradition. Now, the thing is, is that in the Galupa tradition, our tradition, the scholastic side is very much emphasized. And the reason for that is that if you're not well prepared for what could or should happen in your meditation, it's easy to misunderstand your experience. So you might have, like a lot of us have had, a nice blissful meditation, kind of like observing the mind, kind of thinking that it's empty, and just kind of feeling kind of half spacey, half blissful, just kind of really chill, ah, right? And you might even have some interesting kind of energetic experiences, sometimes just through sitting properly, or maybe you used to do some kundalini yoga, or you used to do some yoga, regular yoga practice, or any number of things. And so just by sitting up properly and focusing the mind, you have a lot of bliss arise, and you're kind of thinking about the mind, and it seems to be going well. Now, from a Galupa perspective, that's a little problematic, because then things are kind of happening to you rather than from you. And then that means you have less control and it's harder to repeat. Yeah, you don't really know the mechanisms of what's happening with you or exactly where it's going. You're just kind of riding the wave of old karma, which shows you you've practiced before, which is great, but it doesn't have as much kind of momentum and intentional purposefulness. Now, for people that practice it well, it's incredibly powerful. For people that have teachers that show them how to do Mahamudra and Dzogchen well, it is a perfect practice to do. But from a Galupa perspective, it's important to do a lot of philosophical study on the tenant schools and the different ways of understanding reality. And then to do a lot of study on the mind and the mechanisms of the mind and how it works. And then to bring those two conceptual analytical understandings together when you start to approach Mahamudra or Zogchen meditation. And then when what, things are happening, you know what is in the flow and going the correct direction and what needs to be subtly adjusted or dramatically adjusted. So that's kind of our view as Galupas is that study first, study first, study first will prevent a lot of mistakes down the track. And that actually a huge amount of understanding and wisdom comes from the study process itself. So it's not like you have to wait to practice after you study. The study itself is a very engaging practice because as all of you know, as soon as you start thinking deeply about these things, stuff comes up and you're you know, wrestling with ideas and philosophy and how it relates to your everyday life and all this kind of stuff is really vital. So that's the perspective of the Galupa. And personally, I really love the spaciousness and the creativity and the directness of the Nyingma Kagyu Sakyu, Sakya approach of just kind of going straight to the cushion. I love it personally, but I also know myself and I know that left to my own devices, I am just kind of a vague dreamer, you know, and I'm kind of a little bit tending towards woo-woo, kind of um, intuitive, experiential, poetic, you know, stuff. And so the Galupa keeps me tidy and organized. So it's almost like I'm going against type on purpose because I want to address potential mistakes before they arise. I think if your tendency is very analytical, very like clinical and scholarly, and maybe even a little tight or a little dogmatic, going straight to the Nyingma or the Kagyu might actually be good for you because it will bring in more spaciousness, a bit more flexibility and creativity. And at the end of the day, always cross-fertilize. 
if you feel like your practice is getting stuck. Yeah, if your practice feels like it's getting stuck, like no one's going to go to war over you, like going to a different Dharma center and learning a couple new techniques and then augmenting what you've been doing. Yeah, it's it's perfect, right? Everything is coming from the Buddha. It's just the different strains and the different streams are coming from the perspective of what will suit the disposition of specific disciples. So it's not like, you know, the many sects of Protestantism where they think that they understand Jesus's intention perfectly and then they split and split and split. In Buddhism, theoretically, we're trying to hold open the possibility and the truth that all of these ways were taught by the Buddha to suit different learning styles and dispositions. So you pick what works for you because they are all correct and they all get you there. Does that make sense? So it's not a value judgment or a hierarchy. Yeah, it's just really what suits you. So the only danger really in doing too much cross-fertilization is that you get confused with the different ways the different schools use vocabulary. Or you get a little bit confused and you like mix things that actually don't go together and you get a little bit kind of tangled. So my recommendation is to have one tradition mainly and then once you kind of get some confidence in one tradition, you can start bringing in some threads from other traditions and use it to support what you're doing. But um, it's not a hierarchy. So um, the person that asked that question or any other person, would you like to ask a follow-up about um, these two kind of different ways of practicing before we go on? Or did that make sense? It's not an either or, it's a both and, but you can emphasize one or emphasize the other and it'll all get you there. I don't know if it's just me, but this is the first time I've ever heard anybody explain that. I feel like the other traditions, like we're always dissuaded from doing that. And I feel a sense of relief because I follow the Galoop, but I really love some aspects of the Nyigma. Like I totally understand things sometimes when a, a Rinpoche explains things so I appreciate that I could kind of and I never feel confused or I'm being disloyal and to actually hear somebody say that for the first time I've kept it hush hush all this time <laughs> and just feel relieved like I've never discussed this with my Dharma friends yeah and I feel but I think the key is not to feel confused, which I don't. I actually feel like it's supplementing. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for saying that. It's the first time I ever hear that. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And, and I really appreciate having a couple different types of teachers because I feel like some of them are, as you say, they're like really direct in the moment. And you really feel some experiential quality when you're with them. But if you were to then have to go and like articulate what just happened, you kind of need the other teachers to help put it into words. And then it all kind of collaborates together within you as a person, and then it can integrate. Um, and of course, some of those very experiential teachers are also able to, you know, put into words these amazing kind of experiential things. Um, but it's... Uh, it's also fine to have a lot of teachers, you know, and then to have one or two that are like your go-to ones or the ones you really relate to as like the root guru on your cushion. But again, nobody's in competition. You know, it's like if you sort of have a heart deity and you're like, okay, Tara's my Buddha. Tara's the Buddha that's going to take me to enlightenment. It's not like Chen Rezig is like on the side going, Humph! you know, like, <laughs> like how could the enlightened mind be petty, <laughs> right? So, you know. Anyway, we are petty as human beings. And so sometimes we like bring that to the Dharma center, but the Dharma is not. And so um, be boldly an advocate of that and that non-sectarian approach. Yeah, I think it's really healthy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there was a follow-up question, which is, um, is Mahamudra taught in the Galukpa tradition different from the Kagyu? slightly and some term differences, but there's actually an amazing text that if you guys are curious about this, I really recommend, which is called the Geluk slash Kagyu tradition of Mahamudra by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. It's an amazing book. It's really, it's beautiful. And I think um, Dr. Alexander per Berzin translated it and it's just like really clear, amazing, tidy text. So it kind of brings those two worlds together. Yeah. Okay, so Chen Rezig. Um, I thought to just start with reading a little section from the sutra. 
So this is from the Flower Garland Sutra. And it says, when the moon arises, numberless reflections appear wherever there is water in this world. That is how Chenrezig manifests. Effortlessly, naturally, Chenrezig manifests in all kinds of forms, even as medicine, a bridge or water. Chenrezig manifesting to sentient beings in whatever form benefits them does inconceivable work for sentient beings. So then Lama Zopa Rinpoche's commentary, he says, there's only one moon, but when the moon rises, every body of water reflects it. And the moon's reflection comes effortlessly everywhere there is water, whether ocean, lake, river, or pond, even on a drop of dew. So similarly, since Chenrezig manifests as medicine, bridges, water, and other things, there is no doubt that Chenrezig manifests as our virtuous friend to guide us and give us the opportunity to learn Dharma. And Chenrezig manifests in the six syllables, Om Mani Padme Hum, to purify our negative karma and enable us to collect extensive merits, fulfilling all our wishes and bringing us to enlightenment in the quickest, easiest way. And so the brief explanation is that Om Mani Padme Hum is the mantra of Chenrezig Avalokiteshvara, who is the Buddha of compassion. And the brief meaning is the essence of fully developed and united compassion and wisdom. So whenever you think Chenrezig or Om Mani Padme Hum, you think compassion and wisdom, and that they're together, united, fully developed. So what are compassionate wisdom? It seems like those are very obvious questions, but I think it's important to be clear. Um, why do we need them both? Seems self-evident, but again, we need to be clear. And what happens without them? So if you just sit for a minute, like we know what compassion and wisdom are. We're adults, we've lived in the world, we're Dharma students, but specifically, what are they? Explain it back to yourself. Yeah, just sit analytically and say, compassion is, wisdom is. And both are needed, why? And what happens without them? Both of them, either of them, what happens? Okay. So first we look at what are compassion and wisdom. And sometimes uh, we say method and wisdom because method includes compassion and all the other things in that type. So like patience, love, all that good stuff. So compassion is quite straightforward, but it's good to be clear. It's a mental state that wishes others to be free of suffering. So wishing others to be free of suffering is the very specific way that we define compassion in Buddhism. And sometimes um, people who are Buddhist adjacent or like Buddhist in psychology or Buddhist in any number of things will say that it's like suffering with, which is basically like empathy. Yeah, or it's feeling sorry for, which is like sympathy or pity. And that is not what compassion is. Compassion is seeing that sentient beings are suffering and seeing that they have the potential to be free from that, both simultaneously. And that's where the power is, because if you see only the suffering, you will eventually become fatigued. And that's why they even say things like compassion fatigue, which is a complete misunderstanding of what compassion is. You can absolutely have empathic distress. 100%. Yeah, you can get upregulated, you can get yourself overwhelmed. If you just see suffering and see suffering, only suffering, of course, you're going to get tired. And you want them to be free from suffering, wanting that, wanting that. But if you don't really believe that it's possible, 
you will get burnt out and drained. Of course you will, it's totally human. But this compassion that we're talking about in Buddhism is really acknowledging the fact that the mind of anyone can transform. That the mind of every single living being has Buddha nature. There is no living being that does not have Buddha nature. And in a way, the Buddha nature of all living beings is kind of inviting its actualization at all times, but then it also has innate ignorance getting in the way all the time. And another shortcut you'll hear is sometimes people say, you're already a Buddha, you just have to wake up to it, which is a beautiful thought, but not entirely true. Okay, it's a beautiful thought, but not entirely true. You have Buddha nature, which is of two types. One is the fact that your mind is empty of inherent existence. It has always been empty of inherent existence. It always will be empty of inherent existence, which is fantastic news because it means that you can change and develop it. Yeah, if it were inherently existent, then it would be just as it is, out of nowhere, spontaneously, just boom, this is you. And if there's terrible things, too bad. If there's suffering things, too bad. If there's wonderful things, they're magically intrinsically you. You never learn them. They just were there and they can't be strengthened. And they, you know, all these sort of weird fallacies come about if you think that the mind is inherently existent. But just your life so far proves that it's not. So that's what's called the naturally abiding Buddha nature. The naturally abiding Buddha nature is the fact that your mind lacks inherence, okay? And that is the kind of like the, the very kind of material, even though it's without material, of the Buddha you'll become. The other side of Buddha nature is the adventitious purity or the developmental lineage. It depends on your translator. And this means that this mind that you have, you have to put intention into to train it. You have to train it to be more compassionate, more loving, more wise, and you have to train it out of anger, attachment, jealousy, pride. But you can, so that's great, right? It's not like anything about you is stuck, even if it feels that way. It's just a strong, strong habit if it feels stuck. Yeah. So Buddha nature is something that really needs a lot of airtime in your thinking processes. Because if you truly believe the mind can transform, that means you believe freedom from suffering is possible. And then if you meet someone suffering, you're not overwhelmed by it. You can hold the space for it. So you can fully bear witness to the whole spectrum of their physical pain, their mental pain, their relationship difficulties, whatever is happening, horrible diseases, financial crisis, relationship breakdown, climate change, war, all the things, you can see it all boldly and baldly without it overwhelming you because you know it's not forever. You know that it's not the nature of people to continue to suffer forever. You know that transformation is possible. So you can very bravely bear witness to suffering when you're holding awareness that freedom is possible. And that's what compassion is from a Buddhist perspective. Does that make sense how it's different to empathy, sympathy, pity, things that look like it but aren't? And compassion is like a deeply respectful stance as well. You know when someone is being compassionate towards you when you're feeling really rough and when you feel really unwell, you're so vulnerable, right? And you're really like, oh God, people are seeing me in this state. This is so cringy. Oh my gosh. If someone meets you with compassion, it feels like they're not putting you down for the state you're in right now. They're not looking down on you for that. And it's, it's such a kindness for someone to be like, wow, you're going through something. You're doing it tough. This is rough. And this is not all that you are. I mean, just someone holding the space for you in that way helps move through your suffering, doesn't it? Whereas if they're like, oh, you poor bugger, how did you get yourself into this? Oh, best of luck. Like, not super supportive, <laughs> right? You know, or just like, oh, you poor thing. I would never do such a thing. You poor thing. Like that pity. Oh my gosh. That just like makes your suffering even worse because now you also feel stupid on top of your suffering. Yeah. 
So compassion is a deeply respectful stance that is aware of someone's Buddha nature and also is aware of just impermanence in general. Yeah, this is not all they are. So compassion is one of the key pieces to Chen Rezig practice and wisdom is the other. And so wisdom like compassion means something different in Buddhism than it does in the world, depending on context, right? So here we're talking about the Tibetan word sherab or the Sanskrit word prajna. And the Sanskrit term prajna and its Tibetan equivalent sherab have different applications depending on context. So it's like we don't really have enough words in English. So in the Abhidharma taxonomy of mental factors, prajna refers to a specific mental factor that helps evaluate the various properties or qualities of an object. An object in this context can mean any number of things, not like physical objects only, yeah, objects of the mind. The term can refer simply to intelligence or mental aptitude, but in the context of the Mahayana path, prajna refers to the wisdom aspect of the path, constituted primarily by deep insight into the emptiness of all phenomena. So we're talking about the wisdom realizing emptiness in this context. So hence the term prajna and its Tibetan equivalent are translated variously as wisdom, insight, or intelligence, depending on context. So this wisdom is going together with what's already true. So that one part of your Buddha nature, that naturally abiding potential, that is the fact that your mind is empty of inherent existence. And then you need to realize that right? So your mind is empty of inherent existence. It always has been. It always will be. Knowing it or not knowing it doesn't change it. But once you realize that the mind is empty of inherent existence, then you begin real work in that developmental Buddha nature. Yeah, so you're realizing that the mind is empty of inherent existence. That's the wisdom that we want. Yeah, because that helps cut the very root of the problem. The very root of the problem being grasping at an inherently existent self, which causes all the other problems in our life. Yeah, if we didn't hold the self to be inherently existent, we wouldn't have dualistic thinking of self and other, which then turns into paranoia, suspicion, or neediness and craving, all this push and pull nonsense of the rest of our life. Yeah, so the mind is empty, but we need to realize that. That's what we're talking about here with this wisdom. So compassion and wisdom, why do we need them both? Um, in Mahayana Buddhism, the union of method and wisdom is central to understanding and practicing the path to complete enlightenment Buddhahood, as well as in Tantra specifically, creating the causes for the form and wisdom bodies of a Buddha. Okay, so you need both because sentient beings need both aspects of you. So method refers to the altruistic deeds of a bodhisattva, including the cultivation of compassion and the awakening mind or bodhicitta. Wisdom is the wisdom aspect of the path, primarily deep insight into emptiness. Okay, so then the big question is what happens without them? Okay, and of course, like your mind says, well, everything bad happens without compassion and wisdom. Every problem you've ever experienced is because of the absence of compassion and wisdom, either yours or someone else's. But specifically, or most primarily, just sit for a minute, when there's no compassion, what's there instead? And when there's no wisdom, what's there instead for you as an individual? If compassion is wishing others to be free from suffering, then the opposite is like indifference to that or actively working to harm. If wisdom is understanding the reality of things, which is that they are empty of inherent existence, then the opposite is ignorance that holds them to be inherently existent. So without compassion and wisdom, you have the two demons and they perpetuate. The twin demons or the two demons are self-cherishing and self-grasping. 
So basically the absence of compassion and the absence of wisdom, you have these default settings that come from our innate ignorance. So self-cherishing is the deeply ingrained thought that cherishes the welfare of your own self and makes you oblivious to others' well-being. This is one of the twin demons that lie within our heart and so serve as the source of all misfortune. Self-grasping then is instinctively or innately believing in the intrinsic existence of your own self as well as of the external world. Self here means a substantial, truly existent identity. The wisdom that realizes emptiness eliminates this self-grasping. These two thoughts, self-cherishing and self-grasping, are the primary focus of combat in mind training practice. Okay, so compassion and wisdom are both needed to overcome self-cherishing and self-grasping, as well as to create the cause for the wisdom and form bodies of a Buddha. So therefore we do practices related to Chenrezig, the Buddha of compassion and wisdom. Okay. So this is all chapter two now, and um, chapter two is what um, try and finish this week, reading chapter two. I'll do a lot of it in class, but um, see if you can finish it if you have time. It's really excellent. Um, so just kind of like sitting with for a minute, mind training is what we normally talk about in the Mahayana tradition as kind of like the superior practice Lojong, thought transformation, mind training, right? And that's where you get things like the eight verses of thought transformation and all these kind of like radical reframing methods. Um, a lot of the prayers that we love are mind training, like guide to a bodhisattva's way, a way of life or the wheel of sharp weapons. These are all mind training or lojong. And Yang Zirimshe, I think about a year ago, he was teaching about Tantra and he said something really cool, I thought. He said, Lojong, he said that like Lojong in the mind training tradition is like thought transformation for the conceptual mind, you know, the words, the poetry, the logic. And Tantra is like Lojong for the subtle mind. Yeah, it's kind of like two ways of doing thought transformation, the coarse way and the subtle way, or for the coarse conceptual mind or for the subtle mind. But they're both ways of radically reframing your experience and overcoming those habits of ignorance. So when we're doing Chen Rezig practice, especially in the beginning, it's not like you have to leave behind what you already know, you're elevating it. Yeah, you're elevating what you know about what are different ways to approach life so that it's fuel for practice. But then what are radical ways to approach my inner energy system and my impulses and the kind of negative habitual thought energy that just arises almost as if without any kind of choice, you know, just like habits of anger, habits of desire, habits of ignorance that just kind of we click into as soon as we lose mindfulness. So that those don't actually have to be seen as the same problematic factors as we saw them in the beginning. They can be seen as fuel for practice as well, but we need self-awareness so that we at least know what's happening for us and can start to use it. So there's no kind of avoiding being aware of your stuff, right? You have to become more and more aware of what's going on for you in order to be able to utilize it. Um, oops, wrong one. So in chapter two, um, there's just one of those nice little like who is Chen Rezig folk stories. Um, so I, I'll just read you a little bit and you can read the rest later. But Lama Zopa Rinpoche tells this version of the story, which is that in the blissful Western realm called Having Lotus, there is a kind wheel turning king, King Supreme Goodness, who didn't have a son. He dedicated everything in his life to the Dharma, including his great wealth and all his activities. Every day, the king would make an offering of a lotus flower taken from a nearby lake to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. One day, the servant who went to pick the lotus saw growing from the lake a lotus stem with leaves as huge as an eagle's wings and an open bud in the center. When the servant reported this, the king said, Inside that lotus bud, there will definitely be a holy nirmanakaya that has taken spontaneous birth. 
King's supreme goodness, his ministers, the rest of his entourage went to the lake to see the lotus. When they opened the flower to check what was inside, they saw a 16-year-old youth with a radiant white holy body adorned with the holy signs and exemplifications. He had a white scarf wrapped around his waist and an antelope skin over his left shoulder. Antelopes are so compassionate that it is said that an antelope will stand between a hunter and his prey and offer himself to the hunter in place of the other animal. From his holy mouth, the youth exclaimed over and over how pitiful sentient beings in the six realms are. He kept repeating this. The king and all his entourage prostrated to the youth who was actually Chenrezig manifested in this form and taken birth in the lotus. The king then spread a special cloth on the ground and asked the boy to sit on it and invited him to the palace where he abided as an object of devotion for the king and all his family. Thinking to benefit sentient beings, Chenrezig in the aspect of this 16 year old boy generated bodhicitta. He then made requests to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the three times saying, I will lead each and every sentient being to peerless full enlightenment. He then added, until I have done this, if any thought seeking my own happiness arises, may my head crack into 10 pieces like an azarka, perhaps some kind of fruit, meaning cracking into small pieces. So when Chenrezig made this prayer, Amitabha, Buddha of infinite light said, I will help you accomplish your work for sentient beings. Chenrezig's holy body then emitted six beams with one beam going to each of the six realms where it worked to liberate sentient beings. Later, Chenrezig went to the top of Mount Meru and looked around with his wisdom eye. Even though he had liberated so many sentient beings from the six realms, when he looked, there still seemed to be the same number of them as before. So again, he sent beams to the six realms and liberated sentient beings. With his compassion and wisdom, Chenrezig liberated beings in this way three times, but still the sentient beings did not seem to become fewer in number. Chenrezig then thought, it seems that the samsara has no end. Therefore, I will abide in the blissful state of peace for myself. Because thinking this broke his bodhicitta commitment, Chenrezig's head cracked into 10 pieces. The pain was so unbearable that he screamed and wept. Amitabha then came and collected the pieces of Chenrezig's shattered head from the ground, put the pieces together, and blessed them as 11 faces. As you know, one form of Chenrezig has a thousand arms and eyes and 11 faces. To end samsara, which is beginningless, Amitabha blessed all but one of the faces in a peaceful aspect to subdue sentient beings. For the sentient beings unable to be subdued by peaceful means, Amitabha blessed one face in a wrathful aspect. The face of Amitabha Buddha on the very top of the other head signifies that Chenrezig achieved enlightenment by depending on the kindness of his guru Amitabha. And even after enlightenment, he still had great devotion for his guru. After Amitabha had blessed him, Chenrezig prayed, in order to work for sentient beings until samsara ends, may I have a thousand arms and a thousand eyes. Right at that moment, the thousand arms and thousand eyes manifested. This is just one version of how Chenrezig came to have a thousand arms and a thousand eyes. Just as there are many manifestations of Chenrezig, there are many stories about him. In another one, Amitabha had the thought to benefit transmigratory beings. From his right eye, he sent a beam of white light, which transformed into Chenrezig. And from his left eye, he sent a beam of blue light, which transformed into Tara. Okay, so that's a story. That's one of a million versions of that story, right? Sometimes in the story, he makes that same prayer and he says, may I break into a thousand pieces? And then a demon comes up to him and he says, um, give, you, give me your arm. And Chenrezig chops off his arm and hands it to him with his left hand. And the demon says, you're so rude handing me something with your left hand, you know, the poo hand, that's so rude. And Chenrezig was like, oh my gosh, I just gave you my arm. Sentient beings are impossible. And he lost his bodhicitta and broke into a thousand pieces and then was patched up by Amitabha. And that, that's why he has a thousand arms. So there's a lot of folk stories. There's a lot of beautiful tales. There's a lot of different people who have been kind of called Chenrezig. And at the end of the day, what it's all pointing to is 
what is the archetypal energy that holds both compassion and wisdom together? And how does that manifest? And more importantly, how do we integrate that within ourselves? So when we're doing Chen Rezig practice, we're kind of in a way reaching out to the Chen Rezigness of the Dharmakaya mind of all of the Buddhas, all the enlightened beings. We're reaching out and saying, I could use some support, I am suffering. But we're also reaching in and saying, may I be a compassionate, wise presence deeply and fully for the welfare of others, for the people in my life, for all sentient beings. So you're reaching out and you're reaching in. You're wanting support and you're intending to give support. And it's that both directions that the practice is engaging with. Do you have any, any sort of thoughts so far? No, it's a lot of words, but you know, folk stories are fun, but how does it all land? Um, I, this is kind of digressing a little bit, but I'm always kind of hearing a reference of like Manjushri or just now Chen Rei Sig at the age of 16. Mm. That. So some kind of significance to that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, 16, I mean, if you remember 16, some of us remember 16 more or less clearly. Um, it's sort of like the height of your youth right? It's, the, it's like you're in the prime of your vitality and your strength and your kind of life force. And even though you keep growing after 16 and you might get a little taller and you might get a bit broader and stronger, a little bit of that like life force growing energy starts to wind down a bit and then you kind of plateau and then <laughs> dive, right? <laughs> but like at 16, you're sort of like blossoming with vital energy. Yeah, so 16 is is kind of seen like the prime of youth. So you don't have to be literal if you can th if you think of a different time that for you embodies the prime of youth and vitality and strength and like life force. That's the main thing. And um and they you know they say Chen Rezig is white. He's white like white, not white like Caucasian, right? That none of the Buddhas are like flesh colored. They're all odd colors like green and blue and white and you know all of that. And that is intentional as well. Um, and a lot of this refers to um, the five Buddha families, which we may or may not have time to talk about, but we're kind of pointing to what is the dominant transformational property. So Chen Rezig is white like white, but on the crown of his head is Amitabha, representing his root guru, which indicates he belongs to the lotus family of Amitabha which means the dominant project is transforming the energy that accompanies attachment into discerning wisdom. And so each of the Buddhas have kind of like the emphasized quality and then all the rest of the qualities of an enlightened mind also. But there's kind of a theme. So for us, it might be that it's much of a muchness, which practice we choose because they all wind up working for everything. Or it might be that you feel like, wow, I've got a lot of anger right now. Maybe I need to do Manjushri. Oh, I have a lot of attachment right now. Maybe I need to work with Chen Rezig. So it might be intentional and directive in that way, or it might be it all, any of them work for all of it. So I'll just pick one that resonates with me and the job will get done. But I think it's interesting to kind of know that they do emphasize a specific energy because sometimes when you're doing that practice with a lot of intensity, the obstacle related to that Buddha family might become more dominant than usual. So for example, if you're doing a lot of Chen Rezig practice, your powers of discernment and warmth and luminosity and all of these cool Lotus family factors might actually start to get a bit more strength. But then when you lose mindfulness, you might actually have a little bit more desire and attachment than usual. Yeah, because that's kind of the energy that you're working with. So there's like, just know, just know that. <laughs> so if you're already having trouble working with one of your um, energies, sometimes better to do the sutra version of the antidotes until you get stability and then start working with the tantra versions. Um, there was a question in the chat, which is, is what you have described about compassion, objectless compassion, the wisdom that knows suffering can end, or does this term mean something more? Objectiveless compassion is usually compassion that is married together with the wisdom realizing emptiness. So the
So there's regular compassion that views the suffering of sentient beings and wants them to be free from that. And there's also the compassion that understands impermanence and that sentient beings suffer because of being impermanent and not knowing that they're impermanent, but also acknowledging their impermanence helps us not worry about them so much. Yeah. And then there's objectiveless compassion or um, non-objectifying compassion. And this is the one related to wisdom. So there are kind of three main kinds of compassion and what your question is referring to is the last one. Um, so there's, um, I think Geshe Jumpa Techok has a really good short teaching on the three compassions. Um, if you Google it, I bet you'd find a PDF somewhere. So if you're curious about that um, and maybe I'll hunt for it and send it in the next email. Yeah, um, yeah other questions before we kind of um, take a little stretch? Well, I was just wondering, you know, often we, I see like compassion and great compassion. Are they referring to something or can we just um, inter, interuse those words? <laughs> it, it's tricky because it's like the answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Depends on context. So sometimes compassion and great compassion are used interchangeably. Sometimes great compassion is specifically referring to the highest intention, which is not just wishing sentient beings to be free from suffering, but taking personal responsibility to do so. So sometimes great compassion has that elevated thing of the greatest intention, which is the substantial cause for bodhicitta. So like in the sevenfold cause and effect, right? You have halfway down, you get love, then compassion, then great compassion, or the highest intention, depending on your translator, that last step before bodhicitta. So um, the commentary from my own teacher is that the highest intention and great compassion could be seen as synonymous. Not all scholars will say that. Some of them will say that great compassion is just compassion from a Buddhist perspective. So yeah, it, it's not as tidy as I would like it to be because it depends so much on context. But usually if you see great compassion, have that sense of it being elevated of, I want to work for the welfare of sentient beings to remove their suffering, not just hope it gets better. Good luck. <laughs> right. It's, it's the same antidote as just regular pride. Yeah. So the antidote to pride generally is to see either that all of your qualities are dependently arisen, that everything that is um, amazing and wonderful is learned, yeah, and is born through experience. So you, you, the combination of experience and learning from others is why you wound up with the qualities you have. You didn't just magically have them because you're a special fancy magic person. And, you know, without a certain experience here or a certain learning there, you would not have wound up with those qualities. So there's no need to identify with them. Just be happy that they're there, but don't think of them as like yours, you know, like my precious. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> um, one is to think how much further you have to go. It's good. Pride, bad. Confidence, good. <laughs> okay. All right. Five minutes or uh, three more minutes. <laughs> We're gonna be doing the meditation that's in the book. And then on Thursday, we'll do a slightly different one. And then um, not this weekend, but the following weekend is going to be a practice retreat. And if anybody is local, you're very welcome to come, You know, stay, do the whole day in person. And if not, we'll have the online option as well. So on the um, Vajrapani website are both the in-person and the online options for the retreat. And with this whole series, really like come to what you have energy for. Don't feel pressure. If you miss a session, don't feel like you can't then come back or something like it's it's really spacious and open and you can easily catch up just by reading the book. So whatever works for you. So today we'll do the meditation that's from the book and then Thursday we'll do a slightly different one. So just take a minute and get yourself meditation posture. Nice straight back. Let any tension that you might have accumulated, let it settle. Encourage it to release.
I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit living beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit living beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit living beings. On the crowns of myself and all sentient beings pervading space is a white lotus and moon. On top of it, from Hri, arises Supreme Arya Chenrezig, white and clear, radiating five colored light rays, smiling and looking with eyes of compassion. Of your forearms, the palms of the first two are joined and the two lower two hold a crystal rosary and white lotus. You are adorned with silk and precious jewelry and wear a deerskin upper garment. Amitabha adorns your head. You are seated with your legs in the Vajra posture. A stainless moon is your backrest. In nature, you encompass all objects of refuge and think that you and all sentient beings are making the following request as if in one voice. Lord, your body is white in color, unsoiled by faults. A complete Buddha adorns your head. You look at living beings with eyes of compassion. To you, Chenrezig, I prostrate. Lord, your body is white in color, unsoiled by faults. A complete Buddha adorns your head. You look at living beings with eyes of compassion. To you, Chenrezig, I prostrate. Lord, your body is white in color, unsoiled by faults. A complete Buddha adorns your head. You look at living beings with eyes of compassion. To you, Chenrezig, I prostrate. Through having made requests one pointedly in that way, light rays radiate from the body of the Arya purify impure karmic appearances and mistaken minds. Yours, those in your life, friend, enemy, stranger, all six realms of beings, light going out in all directions. And sentient beings and environments having become purified, the environment becomes Sugavati pure land. The body, speech, and mind of its inhabitants, living beings, become the body, speech, and mind of powerful Chenrezig. Appearance, sound, and awareness, inseparable from emptiness. So you hold this pure vision and remember that it lacks inherent existence. Experiment with that. And if you can hold that beautiful purified appearance, the pure land that will be, the Buddhas that will be, as if it's this present moment already, remembering that all of it is empty of inherent existence, and add the mantra. Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani 
your mind in equipoise on its own essence of the non-conceptualization of the three circles, agent, action, object, all lack inherent existence. See if you can know this, but right now not adding analysis. Just stay with the knowing of that. And think the bodies of myself and others appears as the bodies of the Arya. Aspect of Chenrezig everywhere. Unless you don't have the empowerment, in which case see Chenrezig above all of our heads. The resonance of sounds is the melody of the six syllables. O Mani Padme Hum. The thoughts and conceptualizations are the expanse of great exalted wisdom. And then dedicate. Allow all of the Chenrezigs to dissolve and absorb into all of us sentient beings, blessing our body, speech, and mind. And we come back to our ordinary thoughts, but hold the awareness of that perfect future, which we can make possible. Due to this virtue, may I quickly become powerful Chenrezig and lead all living beings, without exception, to that state. Okay. So that's just a little short one. And it's basically going to be variations on a theme, right? Light going out, light coming in. And what that means and the layers of meaning of that is something that you can learn about over time. But um, just kind of going back to more maybe tangible, concrete-ish things about Chenrezig. Um, and then maybe on Thursday, once you've had time to let it brew, bring any questions you have about the practice or about how to approach it. So as I mentioned before, um, Chenrezig is always guiding us. He's the special deity karmically connected to the people of the Snowland Tibet and manifesting in the form of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And it's all the way back with Guru Shakyamuni Buddha that there were predictions about the Dalai Lamas being Chenrezig and how they would particularly guide sentient beings in Tibet, bringing them refuge and spreading the Dharma. 
Now, because his holiness is vital to the people of the entire planet, Chenrezig is also the special deity for the whole world. But some interesting stuff is that in Tibet, we call Buddha of Compassion Chenrezig, which is Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit. And for Tibetans, Chenrezig is in male aspect, but that seems to be due to karma. Buddha will manifest in whatever way is most beneficial for sentient beings, as a male or a female, a child, an animal, a king, or a beggar. In China, the Buddha of compassion is in the female aspect of Kuan Yin, and in Japan, she is called Genin. So whatever the aspect, Chenrezig is the embodiment of compassion of the numberless Buddhas of the past, present, and future, here to guide us and liberate us from all suffering and the causes of suffering and lead us to liberation and enlightenment. So before we get into the symbolism, just like a side note on the gender stuff, it's we have to keep remembering that the Buddhas want to manifest in a way that we can relate to, hear, and follow. So, you know, common questions at Dharma centers are, why are most of the people in leadership positions men? Um, you know, could there be more balance? You know, is, that would be nice, right? And of course, the reason is, is because society is unbalanced. And so the Buddhas manifest in a way that has some sort of authority, right? So when men are culturally the ones with authority, Buddhas will manifest as men like the lamas so that people will listen to them. If they manifested as women, even though they would be perfect Buddhas, people wouldn't listen to them. Although that's changing, thank goodness, right? So we don't want to kind of get caught up in like a harumph, like humph, you know, sort of kind of like grumble about like, why is it always boys? <sighs> right? <laughs> right? This is obviously my inner narrative. Um, <laughs> right? Why is it always boys? But it's really like the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is genderless and gender full, right? Genderless and gender full. They're going to manifest in ways that are going to strike a chord with us. In these archetypal images with certain colors, shapes, and forms, kind of manifesting is whatever gender, whatever kind of uh, age, whatever kind of like culturally significant facial features, whatever. And none of that is the Buddha. That's the forms the Buddhas are taking in order to benefit us. So also the Buddhas can manifest as a bridge, which is not particularly gender full, right? <laughs> I'm sure some languages gender a bridge, but you know, bridges don't generally have gender, yes. Buddhas will manifest that way because sentient beings need to get across, right? Buddhas might manifest as a gust of wind, to turn your head a certain time and place to look at something that will act as a catalyst for a new way of thinking. The new way of thinking was yours to engage with or not, but the Buddha may have sent the gust of wind to help. So this is the way we want to kind of start thinking about how are the Buddhas helping us. They cannot inject us with insight. They cannot make us feel their support because they are flooding us with love and support constantly, but we are shut down to that. We're in our little prison of innate ignorance and our dualistic thinking, which is why we feel alienated and alone. And there are Buddhas on every single atom, and yet we can feel completely lonely and isolated. So the question is not begging them to come here, begging them to take the forms we like, they already are here and could take those forms. It's about opening up and purifying and kind of releasing expectations in a way that just settles into the fact that the enlightened mind is present and then can manifest in whatever way is going to benefit us. So when you get into higher and higher forms of Tantra, the forms actually get even more extreme. So we're used to these beautiful lower Tantra, Kriya Tantra deities, which are generally in peaceful aspect. You know, Chenrezig gently smiling, Tara gently smiling, Manjushri gently smiling. But then when you move into the higher Tantras, they are smiling, but like in a quite an intense way, or they're like angry looking or all sorts of drama is happening. And what they're doing is displaying the very affliction that they're seeking to dominate. Yeah, so they're showing like a wrathful aspect in order to intimidate anger. 
not to intimidate sentient beings, not to dominate sentient beings, but to help their sort of difficult negative emotions retreat and subdue, mirroring and then transforming. So you're working on different levels of these things, but at this st first stage, all the Buddhas just look quite sweet. Yes, quite sweet. And <laughs> you could start with that quite sweet level, and then gradually you can work up your strength to working with more and more dramatic uh, depictions, but it's all variations of a theme. So don't get lost in form. And I think it's interesting that Chenrezig is male depicted in some countries and female depicted in others. And then a lot of artists renderings, a sort of ambiguous sort of gender fluid kind of creature. And at the end of the day, it does not matter. It's just that we're used to a humanish form having a humanish gender. So therefore they're going to look that way for our sake. Otherwise we can't cope. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Ish? Yeah, but they could manifest as anything. They could be your sweet little dog, right? And the Buddhas are like, okay, how can I get through to them? How can I get through to them? I will manifest as a stray dog. They will think, oh, how cute and feed me. And that way they will accumulate virtue. How can we bring out the best and sentient things? But it's still up to us whether or not we engage with that. So that's what we're working on with these practices is to reach back. Imagine the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas constantly reaching for you. It just needs a little bit of you to reach back and that linkage is felt. Does it sort of land to frame it that way or do you feel doubts or obstacles or anything like that? <laughs> Still processing? I mean, it's fine to have doubts. It's good to have doubts. And, uh, you know, I don't know when in our lives we've had experiences of like, awe or wonder or transcendence or connection and often it was just with regular people but regular people in a specific context you know it's your regular friend who is regular and nice but they say something at just the right time and it lands and it touches your heart and you have a cognitive shift and you feel something more about how life works and how people are and maybe it was from that friend and their wisdom meeting you and your wisdom, or maybe it was the Buddhas utilizing that friend in that moment when they had openness with the ingredients that friend had to offer and sort of gently helping that process along. And maybe it doesn't even matter which it is. Is it from the divine or do we all have the spark of the divine and we just need to meet it in one another? At the end of the day, I think it really comes down to what do I need to do to open what do I need to do to reach back and to like have more intention in just the very priority of compassion? Because when you prioritize compassion towards others, you seem to find more compassion coming towards you. But only if you do it without expectations. And it's so hard to offer without expectations. But probably we have experience in our life when we've been in that kind of open hearted, less pressurized way. And then so much comes back to us, but not if you wanted it or planned for it, <laughs> which is annoying, but true. Um, so someone is asking, how do you know when the stray dog is a Buddha? You don't, <laughs> you don't, but the Buddha is always present is the thing. And, you know, really we will not know who anyone is until we're enlightened. We cannot take another person's measure. Yeah, like Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin, thought that he was horrible and kept trying to kill the Buddha. Lots of people think his holiness is a demon, right? Like, we don't know who anyone is. But if you start relating to people's Buddha nature, and maybe not just their Buddha nature, but as if they were already Buddhas, maybe it brings the best out of them. But then if you do that too fundamentally, too tightly, with too much kind of like, I don't know, fanaticism it gets weird it doesn't work and you get a little nuts yeah but like what if in every interaction you held open the possibility that this was a buddha trying to teach me something or is a sentient being suffering who needs me and you have no idea which it is but you engage because actually the behavior might be quite similar if it's a Buddha trying to teach you something or it's a suffering sentient being who needs you, either way, you're going to be polite, right? Either way, you're going to be very intentional and alert. 
And if it's a Buddha trying to teach you something, they're trying to teach you how to be compassionate. So what are the behaviors and men and like strong motivations of compassion you can bring to that moment? But yes, frustratingly, you will not know if the stray dog is a stray dog or a Buddha manifesting as a stray dog until you yourself are a Buddha. Darn it. <laughs> but you can make a guess. Um, and then there was a one in the chat that said um, the retreats at Vajrapani will also be on Zoom. So there's an online option. It's totally optional. It's mainly going to be practice. Um, and then Q&A related to practice. There'll be a little bit of new information that's specific to the practices. But um, if you um, don't have time or space to come, don't feel like you'll miss out on a huge thing in the course. It's, it's all on the website, um, but not this weekend, the following weekend. Okay. Yep. Yep. And I'll record them and put them on YouTube too, if you, it's a weird time zone. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll continue with Chen Rezig next week. Um, sorry, I didn't get into as much of the symbolism as I intended to, but I will um, on Thursday. And there's a really cool section about the mantra that we'll go into as well. And um, Snae's put the link in the chat for you guys about the retreat. So if you um, need that, there it is. We'll go ahead and dedicate. Janchu Sanchorim Boshe, Vajrapanam Ke Gyuachi, Ke Panyam Pame Pai, Gone Gondu Pawasho, Tony Dawarim Boshe, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuachi, Ke Panyam Pame Pai, Gone Gondu Pawasho. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night or day. <laughs>